uh, get on to the detail. Can I first give an update on the condition of the Prime Minister? I know a lot of people will be concerned about that. I can tell you he's receiving the very best care from the excellent medical team at St Thomas's Hospital. He remains stable overnight. He's receiving standard oxygen treatment and breathing without any assistance. He's not required any mechanical ventilation or non-invasive respiratory support. He remains in good spirits and in keeping with usual clinical practice, his progress continues to be monitored closely in critical care and we'll give further updates on the PM's condition when there are any material developments. And I know that there's been a groundswell of messages of support uh, from people here at home, uh, from leaders across the world, and I know that everyone will want to join with me in wishing the Prime Minister a very swift recovery. As you'll know, the Prime Minister asked me to deputise for him whilst he recovers, and in line with the Prime Minister's instructions, this morning I chaired the meeting of senior ministers tackling coronavirus and this afternoon I chaired an update for members of the Cabinet. And I think it's probably worth just remembering that, as will be the case for many people up and down the country who know someone at work who's fallen ill with the coronavirus, it comes as a shock to all of us. He's not just the Prime Minister. For all of us in Cabinet, he's not just our boss. He's also a colleague and he's also our friend. So all of our thoughts and prayers or with the Prime Minister at this time, with Carrie and with his whole family. And I'm confident he'll pull through. Because if there's one thing I know about this Prime Minister, he's a fighter. And he'll be back at the helm, leading us through this crisis in short order. And of course, for us in Cabinet, we know exactly what he wants from us and what he uh, expects from us right now. And following the Cabinet discussion today, I can reassure the Prime Minister and we can reassure the public that his team will not blink and we will not flinch from the task at hand at this crucial moment. We will keep all of our focus and all of our resolve with calm determination on delivering the government's plan to defeat the coronavirus. And it's with that objective and with that unity of purpose that the Cabinet turned to business today. We had reports from four ministerial groups on the action we're taking across all of the strategic priority areas, including NHS capacity, procurement of ventilators and personal protective equipment, the delivery of public services, including social care, on the economy and our support for both businesses and workers, and of course on the international action we're taking to reinforce our efforts on the home front. As we've explained before, our action plan aims to slow the spread of the virus, so fewer people need hospital treatment at any one time, and that will help us protect the NHS's ability to cope. At every step, we've been following the scientific advice, the medical advice, and we've been very deliberate in the actions that we've taken, so that we take the right steps at the right moment in time. We're increasing our NHS capacity by dramatically expanding the number of beds, key staff, life-saving equipment on the front line, so people have the care they need when they need it most. And as we've consistently said, we're instructing people to stay at home so we can protect the NHS and so that we can save lives. So today I can report that through the government's ongoing monitoring and testing programme, that again, as of today, 213,181 people have now been tested for the coronavirus. 55,242 people have tested positive. The number of people admitted to hospital with coronavirus symptoms now stands at 18,589. And of those who have contracted the virus, 6,159 have, I'm very sorry to say, died. Every death in this pandemic is a tragedy and our thoughts and our prayers are with their loved ones at what must be an incredibly difficult time. And I think these figures reinforce that the single most important thing that we can all of us do right now in this national effort to defeat the coronavirus is keep on following the government's advice, which is to stay home, protect the NHS and save lives. And I'll now turn to Sir Patrick, who I think will talk us through some of the data. Thank you very much. May I have the first slide, please? It's worth remembering this is a brand new illness. It transmits relatively easily, and in some people, of course, it's severe. 
It's therefore important that we break the transmission in society. We do not allow this virus to go from household to household, and that's what the social distancing measures are about, trying to slow the rate of transmission. In order to know whether those measures are working, we track a number of things, and here you can see the transport use change, which we've shown before, indicating very substantial reductions in the use of London Underground, the buses, National Rail, and indeed use of all motor vehicles. This and other measures show that the contact between people has reduced dramatically as a result of the social distancing measures that have been put in place. That in turn should lead to a substantial reduction in the transmission of the virus in the community. This, if I can have the next slide, please, moves then through into the fewer new cases appearing is the aim, to try and reduce the number of new cases. This shows the number of cases since the 16th of March through to the 7th of April. And what you can see is there is not that big upswing of growth that we talked about at the beginning. There is a fairly steady increase in numbers. It's possible that we're beginning to see the beginning of change in terms of the curve flattening a little bit. We won't know that for sure for a week or so. But what we're not seeing is an acceleration. It's important that we keep these new cases down because, of course, this in turn leads to the number of people going into hospital. And the aim all along is to reduce the number of cases below the capacity for the NHS and to save lives. Can I have the next slide, please? This graph shows the number of hospital admissions in London at the top and then in other areas. You can see again there's been a steady increase since the 16th of March up until the 7th of April, but there hasn't been the accelerated takeoff. And again, it's possible that we're beginning to see the start of a change where we might see numbers flattening off. We can't, won't be sure about that for a week or so, and we need to keep looking at it. But it does begin to suggest that things might be moving in the right direction in terms of numbers, and it's important that we carry on with the measures we've got in place in order to make sure that this does go in the right direction. The important thing beyond these numbers is what happens in intensive care units, and that we keep the intensive care unit number down as well. And that's another thing which may be moving in the right direction, but I do want to hear say a big thank you to everybody in the NHS, the frontline staff who are working so hard to make this work. One other point, as well as looking at numbers, there are clinical trials starting, trying to look at treatments that might make a difference. And as of this afternoon, there are over 1,900 patients in clinical trials across 100 hospitals. That's an important part of how we're going to tackle this. The ICU beds are important, and the next slide, please, shows that the uh, number of ICU beds has been increasing. So this is a graph over time from the 21st of March to the 6th of April, showing an increase in the ICU beds. That's been most marked in London, which has had the biggest um, uh, outbreak so far, but it'll increase in the rest of the country. And the new Nightingale hospitals in London, Birmingham, Manchester, Bristol, Harrogate, and, and further increases in capacity are what the NHS is planning for to cope with uh, the numbers that we're talking about. And finally, I've talked about the beginning, I've talked about the fact that we need to see that coming through into admissions to hospitals and to ICU, and then it takes a few weeks for that to feed through, unfortunately, for some people, into death. And I'd like to just show the death figures. So these are the graphs showing the numbers of deaths across different countries. And you can see that despite a little uptick in the numbers today, and the numbers do bounce around, the UK is on track. We're roughly uh, a couple of weeks behind France, a few weeks behind Italy in terms of the numbers. But you can see that broadly, things across Europe move in the same direction. And we would expect the numbers of deaths to lag after the ICU cases by a couple of weeks. So we should expect these to start coming down in two or three weeks' time. Thank you, Foreign Secretary. Thank you, Patrick. Um, now happy to take some questions from the media. Laura Kunzberg from the BBC. Um, thank you very much, Foreign Secretary. Um, with the Prime Minister absent at this vital time, if there is a genuine disagreement in the Cabinet, who actually makes the decision? 
And if I can ask the Chief Scientific Advisor, you've shown that there has been an increase in the capacity of the number of intensive care beds available around the country. But on the current numbers, will there be enough beds as this grows? Well, first of all, uh, decision making by government is made by collective cabinet responsibility. So that is the same um, as before. But we've got very clear directions, very clear instructions from the Prime Minister. And we're focused uh, with total unity and total resolve on implementing them so that when he's back in, I hope in very short order, uh, we will have made the progress that he would expect and that the country would expect. In terms of the ICU beds, and, and uh, Chris Whitty has been clear about this as well, there are always times in every winter when ICU beds top out in individual hospitals, and, and that may happen, and I can't guarantee it won't. What we can say, though, is that the numbers, uh, as we look at them now, look as though we should come in about right. Um, there shouldn't be a, an overall increase above the number of beds available. Uh, the NHS, I think, has done an amazing job of increasing the capacity of, of, of ICU, and so things seem to be tracking in the right direction, but I don't think I can say more than that. I don't know, Chris, whether you want to add anything. I agree. Laura, is that okay, or did you want to come back on any of it? Um, yeah, I mean, Foreign Secretary, Cabinet always, in theory, runs on collective responsibilities, but there are always times when, in the end, one person has to make the decision. In normal circumstances, the Prime Minister is the ultimate decision maker. In these circumstances, are you that person? Or what happens if there is no agreement? Well, we, as I said, we've got collective cabinet responsibility, but the arrangements are very clear. The Prime Minister has asked for me to deputise for him in discharging the responsibilities uh, for as long as he's unable to do that. And we have got in the discharge of uh, those responsibilities and frankly, the direction, the instructions he's given, very clear plans. So we're, we're all focused uh, with a unity of purpose and a clear and calm determination to get that done from the procurement of PPE, uh, getting it to the front line to supporting businesses and all of the work uh, in DFID and the Foreign Office that we're doing uh, on the international level to reinforce uh, that effort on the home front. Robert Peston, ITV. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Mr. Raab, you say that you have very clear instructions from the Prime Minister about what to do, but if there needed to be a significant change of direction, do you have the authority to make that change of direction, or would you wait for the Prime Minister's return? And if I could ask uh, Sir Patrick and uh, Mr. Whitty, your own chart today does show the, the rate of growth in the number of deaths in Germany is much slower than the other European countries, including the UK, that you cite. What is there that we can learn from Germany? Well, look, Rob, on your question to me, I'm been tasked uh, when I was appointed, given very clear steer from the Prime Minister, and obviously as we've been going through this crisis, uh, very clear instructions uh, in terms of dealing with coronavirus, and he's asked me to deputise for him for as long as is necessary, but the normal Cabinet collective responsibility and principles that inform that will apply. Patrick. We look at all of the countries and try and understand what differences there are in terms of responses. Uh, we look right the way across the world in regular contact with the chief scientific advisors and, and chief medical officers in other countries to try and understand different approaches taken and different effects. Uh, you're right, the German curve looks as though it's lower at the moment, and that is important. And I don't have a clear answer for you to exactly what it is, uh, the reason for that. And there are obviously two things that one will look at in terms of any, any response to any outbreak. One is the virus itself, and the other is the society into which that virus comes. And there are things to do with demographics, there are things to do with the way um, systems are organised, and of course there may be differences in the way certain responses have been taken. And we don't know, but we're in regular contact with the other countries. Again, i see if Chris wants to add anything to that. Well, I think that the one thing I'd add to that is we all know that uh, Germany got ahead uh, in terms of its ability to do testing for uh, the virus, and there's a lot to learn from that, and we've been trying to learn the lessons from that. Did you want to follow up there, Rob? Or we... Well, it was, it, was, it was just, you didn't quite say that you feel confident that if you had to make a change of direction and you weren't able to communicate with the Prime Minister, would you have the confidence in doing that? I've got total confidence in the arrangements that the Prime Minister has put in place so that I can discharge the responsibility for him, deputising for him uh, while he's out of action. And obviously, we hope that will be uh, for a very limited period of time. Mark Austin from Sky. 
Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Foreign Secretary. Um, first and foremost, everyone on this programme and everybody at Sky News send their very best to the Prime Minister. We wish him a speedy uh, recovery. My question is this, the Prime Minister is in intensive care, the Health Secretary caught the virus, the Chief Medical Officer caught the virus, we're very pleased to see him back at work, but three key people responsible for telling the country how not to get it got it. So with respect, and I mean it is with respect, how did it come to this and how was that allowed to happen? Because you have a virus which is totally indiscriminate and uh, we follow, uh, all of us, the guidance as carefully as possible, um, but it's a, a very dangerous virus, um, it's very contagious and uh, it just goes to show that uh, no one is impervious uh, to it and we all need to follow the guidance, both the letter and the spirit. Did you want and, to come back, Chris? Mark? Yeah, and Chris, um, does he have a, an answer? Uh, well, the answer is exactly the same, really. Uh, we all know that this is an extremely easy virus to pass on. That is exactly why the lockdown uh, was necessary. That was why the very large number of things that we've had to ask people to do and not do uh, are in place, because it is extremely easy to catch this virus and it is extremely easy to pass it on, even if people take really careful precautions in terms of things like washing their hands, which remains critical. So, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very clear illustration of the fact that this is why we're having to do this to ensure that we protect the NHS and save the lives of other people. Jason Groves from the Daily Mail. Thanks, Mr. Barb. Um, uh, you mentioned that you've had instructions from the PM. I wonder, have you had instructions about what he wants to do about the looming decision on whether to extend the lockdown. Uh, and can you give the country any idea of what that might be? We're seeing Germany and Austria level with people about how long things might take and how they might be lifted. And a, a question for Sir Patrick. Last month in that room, you told us we were three or four weeks behind Italy. Uh, we seem, given the shocking death toll today, to still be getting a similar outcome uh, to Italy. Are there things that we could and should have done, or was this outcome always inevitable? And are there things we can do now uh, to make a difference? Well, Jason, just in terms of uh, the review, we're not at that stage yet. We will take any decision when the time is right, based on the facts and the scientific and medical advice. And our number one and our overriding focus right now, uh, as has just been demonstrated by the previous question, is to remain absolutely uh, focused on conveying the key message, which is everyone needs to keep adhering to this uh, guidance. We've got a long bank holiday uh, Easter weekend coming up, uh, warm weather. We understand uh, that people uh, uh, are making big sacrifices to follow this guidance. It is helping. It is contributing to our ability to tackle the, the coronavirus. The worst thing now will be to take our foot off the, the pedal to uh, ease up on that and risk uh, losing the gains that have been made. So it's absolutely critical that people uh, keep up that discipline and the vast majority will, uh, and we hope everyone will uh, follow that example because it is the way to make sure we consolidate the progress we've made and don't lose the progress we've made. Chris, I don't know. Patrick. Oh, it's Patrick. Apologies. Yeah, um, so, so this is a pandemic, meaning it's everywhere. And um, that's why we're seeing it across many different countries and across all populations. And um, we are probably three or four weeks behind Italy in terms of um, uh, the outbreak. It doesn't mean we end up with the same numbers. And, of course, it's important that as the ICU capacity has been built up, this idea of keeping the numbers below the ICU capacity, that's absolutely critical. Uh, it's also worth, um, worth just reflecting on the fact that the most important thing we can do is to implement the measures that are in place now to keep this suppressed. That's really, really important. It's what we need to be focused on now. It's how we're going to come out the other side to be able to say that the numbers are under control and we can then move on to the next phase. Did you want to come back, Jason, on any of that? Well, just to clarify, Mr. Barber, I mean, it sounds like the, the instructions you're getting from the PM is that this this lockdown is going to have to stay. We are going to have to keep our foot on the pedal for a few more weeks at least. Is that is that a fair interpretation? No, I think we've been clear all along. We'll be guided 
by the evidence uh, that our um, the measures that we've put in place on social distancing, on everything else, uh, the impact that they've had. And once we've got reliable data on that, uh, which will come up in the, uh, the days uh, ahead, we can consider whether and when and how we want to take any further decisions. But our number one focus right now is to keep the discipline of compliance with those measures because it will help us make progress. And that's the way we'll get through this crisis and get out the other side as quickly and as effectively as possible. Heather Stewart from The Guardian. Oh, hello there. This is a follow up to Jason's question to some extent. Um, were you suggesting there that we won't see a three week review of the lockdown measures as, as we were promised uh, when they were put in place, that we won't see that if the Prime Minister is still in hospital? Will you wait until he's out of hospital um, to do that? Um, and slightly more broadly, that the, the modelling from, that was published on Friday with the London School of hygiene and tropical medicine suggested it, it, that measures might have to stay in place for many months, social distancing for many months, at least, they said, um, with periodic lockdowns in order to keep the outbreak within the capacity of the NHS. I wonder whether that seems plausible and whether it's now time to level with people, with kids who are wondering whether they're going to see their friends before the end of the summer term and so on, that this is going to have to go on for, for months, not weeks. Well, I think we have levelled with everyone from the outset. We've been as transparent as possible uh, in relation to all of the data and all the information. That's why we've got uh, the Chief Scientific Advisor and the Chief Medical Officer here. Uh, but the critical thing is to take evidence-based uh, decisions. And so we've said that we will take any review once we've got the evidence that the measures are working and having the kind of impact taking us past the peak, which means that they can be responsibly done. We're not at that stage yet. CMA, do you want to add anything? Oh, well, but the only thing I'd add is really what we said yesterday. I think it's really important that we get to the point that we, are, uh, we all are confident that we're beyond the peak. Uh, and then at that point, start making it clear what combination of things and over what period of time uh, seems a sensible combination uh, to take us through. Because as, as, as I said yesterday, uh, there are a large number of different things we need to take into account here in terms of the impact on health. Uh, the direct effects of uh, the, the virus itself and also the indirect effects on the health service more widely. Heather, do you want to follow up or anything else you yeah, want so to just in, in terms of when we might see that review, it, it, it depends on when you feel you have enough and relevant enough data. We won't necessarily see a three week review. Uh, it, it'll be evidence-based, and so we'll rely on the evidence we get from the impact of the measures that have already been taken. And as Chris said, what we need to do is get beyond the peak when we can responsibly uh, take any further decisions based, as I said, on the evidence that we've got. We've set that position out all along, and, and we want to follow it because it's the right thing to do. And again, it's the right thing to do to get us effectively and as quickly as possible through the coronavirus challenge. Joe Murphy from the Evening Standard. Mr. Rob, can I join you in wishing the best to the Prime Minister and his recovery? Um, can you say how the government is doing on course to meet the target of 100,000 tests per day? And as the man who's now in charge, will you ensure personally it's delivered by the end of the, May, of the month? And Professor Whitty, a lot of people are worried that care homes for the elderly are not getting the same support as other branches of the health and care service. Um, can you address such worries as whether doctors and nurses will go into homes rather than simply Skype patients, whether there'll be medical, medically qualified professionals going in, um, and whether you can stop agency nurses from, or carers rather, from looking after more than one home and then risking spreading? And why are the deaths in care homes not included in the daily tally of figures? Thanks, Joe. So just on the most recent data that's been uh, released on tests, there were 14,000 in a single day. Um, so that shows progress. We've had 7,500 NHS workers and their families tested. Uh, and we've got nine drive-through uh, sites currently operational in Nottingham, Chessington, Greenwich, Wembley, Sandwell, Manchester, Belfast, Edgbaston and Glasgow, and Cardiff will be the 10th, which will be open shortly. So we are making progress on that. In terms of the data uh, question on ONS versus the NHS, uh, I don't know whether Sir Patrick you wanted to address that. Uh, happy to do that. The, the, the international reporting standards for deaths, all the other countries are based on hospitalised deaths confirmed, and that's the same as the data that you're seeing. Uh, the ONS data, which are important, look at overall 
um, deaths on death certificates where coronavirus is mentioned so that they are not confirmed deaths necessarily. It's important to have both of those, but that's what the d difference between the two numbers is. So just to add on the care homes. Uh, uh, so firstly, just to add to that, the ONS data does include care home deaths. Uh, the uh, hospital data obviously does not. So that's uh, it's one of the key differences. In terms of um, uh, the uh, looking after the residents of uh, care homes and indeed nursing homes, we've said right from the beginning that this is one of the most difficult things we have to do and one of the most important things we have to do. Uh, and that needs to, in a sense, balance the need to have the right nursing, medical and other care support for the care homes whilst minimising people going into care homes unnecessarily because almost by definition uh, most residents of care homes are relatively vulnerable people and it is important we get that balance right uh, that we protect people for example when they come back from hospital uh, that they do get the, the right medical care uh, but as I said right at the beginning of this epidemic uh, care homes and nursing homes have, are going to provide us with some of the biggest challenges. And it's, you know, we have seen already uh, that um, over 9% of care homes have reported cases. Uh, I regret to say I think the number, of, the number will go up over time, despite excellent work by the, uh, the care home staff, by nurses who go in and by doctors. And I would encourage people not to go into care homes unless they need to. Rob Merrick from the Indy. Thank you very much, Foreign Secretary. A question first for Professor Whitty, if I can. Uh, the Independent has seen a letter to GPs from Jenny Harris, which appears to raise concerns that uh, some highly vulnerable people who need to be shielded are not being shielded. We've spoken to the family of a 95-year-old deaf blind woman who's totally dependent on her daughter for care. She doesn't meet the criteria, she's been told. Are you concerned that there are many, many people out there who are not being shielded as they should? And what, would you, what are you going to do about that? Uh, and a question, please, for you, Mr. Rob. Uh, returning to Joe's question, uh, the government made a promise to the British people last week that uh, 100,000 daily tests would be carried out by the end of the month. We learned yesterday that the antibody tests won't be ready by that date. So can I just be clear, are you now promising you will carry out 100,000 daily antigen tests, the test for the virus itself, by the end of the month? And if you can't meet that commitment, will somebody carry the can? Well, look, just on that, I think the health sector is very clear on the target. And what I've tried to set out is the progress that we've made. Clearly more work to do, but important that we've made the progress we have so far. Chris. So on shielding, it's, it's uh, so the, the situation with shielding is there are, there are broadly three groups of people who we've asked to do different things. Uh, there's everybody who we really want to stay at home unless they're going out for work, uh, for necessary food and medicine, for medical care, or for exercise and we've really been very clear about that because that is the way we protect everybody including the, the people who are shielded then there's a higher risk group of people who are people on the whole who are over 70 uh, and have pre-existing health conditions uh, which, ma which makes up roughly 16, 000, 16 million people overall and the, the recommendations are the same for those but we really need them to do it for their own protection it's not just to protect the NHS and to protect wider society although it helps with that but it also really helps to protect them but there's this particularly vulnerable group of um, around uh, about just under 1.5 million people, the exact numbers uh, are, are, are kind of being sorted out at the moment, uh, who we are very keen to have the absolute minimum uh, contact possible for quite a long period of time. And I think what we've been very clear is that there's a group of people who we are able to identify, which is the great majority, who have been identified and written to in a first wave, and there's a second wave of letters going out today from uh, NHS Digital uh, over this week, uh, which is we have identified centrally from their medical records this is necessary. There are additional people who have been identified either by specialist medical uh, groups or, in some cases, by GPs, who know that someone has got a group of conditions or a particular condition that isn't on the list but makes them particularly vulnerable. But equally, so, so people have been added to the list as a result of that. Equally, 
there have been some people who will have taken a decision in discussion with their GP that they simply do not wish to be part of this, that they, the idea of being for many weeks completely cut off, at least physically, from uh, society except for the absolute basic necessities. Of course, we hope people will be linked uh, to people by social media and other areas, that this is not something they wish to do. And this particularly, for example, might apply to people who are, have had a terminal diagnosis and are in palliative care and are on the last uh, stages, where they would just make a rational life decision that was not what they wish to do. So there will be people, at, uh, in terms of around the, uh, around the big group who will have been identified, there will be some people who go into the shielding programme who are not initially identified, and there'll be some people who initially were identified who either because their medical condition is different from how it has been centrally uh, recorded or because of their own choices in discussion with their doctor will choose not to be part of that. And that was always something we expected to happen. Did you have a follow-up, Rob? Can I come back to you, Mr Rao? I don't think you really answered my question. Just to be clear, we know that the antibody test will not be ready by the end of the month. So can you say, is your promise now today that the government will carry out 100,000 daily antigen tests by the end of the month? Well, I'm not going to say anything different from what the Health Secretary has already said. Uh, what I, I hope people understand is, is that we are striving uh, every sinew uh, to get both sets of tests uh, to the highest level we can. That involves tapping the uh, domestic sources and su supplies, but also using the Foreign Office Network and we're teaming up with DFID and the Department for International Trade to try and get as many international supplies. But of course, uh, lots of these things are in very high demand, but we are doing everything we can on every front uh, to get all of the, the testing capabilities we need. And uh, yes, the, he the Health Secretary's 100,000 per day target still stands. Thank you all very much.